I don't have a home. All my things went with the water. I'm going to give birth this month. I have nothing. We can't take it anymore. There's no other place for us to go to, nowhere to sleep. Hi, I'm Malika Bilal. I'm Ahmed Sabuddin, and you're in the stream. After Hurricane Matthew, Haiti needs help, but the foreign role there is complicated. Today, Haiti's challenges and the global response. More than 500 people died, more than 300 schools damaged. Thousands of Haitians live in provisional shelters, without water, without food, without health care. Various communities are still inaccessible. Haiti faces a new crisis in the aftermath of Hurricane Matthew. The Category 4 storm brought more devastation six years after a massive earthquake. The UN says 1.4 million people need urgent humanitarian aid. The world is once again mobilizing to help, but the 2010 earthquake response has left some wary of chipping in. Billions of dollars were pledged, but very little reached those in need. In fact, most donations bypassed the Haitian government and went directly to foreign contractors and NGOs. Well, the aid effort is just one part of a controversial foreign role since Haiti's founding days. A slave revolt won Haiti's independence in 1804, but it was forced to pay billions of dollars in, quote, reparations, unquote, to former colonizer France until the mid-20th century. In 1991, a U.S.-backed coup ended Haiti's first elected government. The U.S. supported another coup in 2004 and then intervened to help decide the 2010 presidential race. Food aid has wiped out Haitian farmers unable to compete with subsidized U.S. rice and corn. And a United Nations peacekeeping force brought cholera to Haiti after the earthquake. But only this year, after some 10,000 deaths, did the U.N. finally admit responsibility. Many hoped new presidential elections would restore autonomy and stability to the Haitian government, but the storm delayed the vote for a fourth time. So to discuss Haiti's challenges and the foreign role, we're joined by Gary Pierre Pierre, founder of the Haitian Times. Jake Johnston is a research associate at the Center for Economic and Policy Research. Danny Glover, actor and activist involved in Haiti for over two decades. Stefan Vincent is chief information officer in the office of Haiti's prime minister. And Nina Raoul is executive director of Haitian Women for Haitian Refugees. Welcome to the stream, everyone. I want to get started on my laptop with a tweet we got from our community. Uh, this was actually tweeted by a U.S. football player of Haitian descent, Elvis Dumerville, who says, people who are not from Haiti don't understand that most homes are not built to withstand a hurricane or an earthquake. And to give our viewers a sense of what that means and what that looks like, Here's a picture one of our guests sent us. Uh, Nina, she, your organization is working with people like this woman who lost her goats and her roof in this latest hurricane. How are people coping, Nina? Well, and she's in a community called Cadno, which is in the Neep region of, of um, Haiti, which is located in the southwest, um, the top of the southwest peninsula, which was one of the hardest hit areas in Haiti from um, Hurricane Matthew. So they lost, she had 68 goats, this woman in the picture that you showed earlier, and she lost the roof of her home. The, that community is so remote, they didn't even know that the hurricane was coming. Many people don't have radios there. Um, the neighboring community, Baco Noir, that's where my husband's from. I was just there last month. It was green. Right now, that every, everything's been wiped out, all the trees, all the crop. Um, folks are just dealing with immediate needs. Um, there, there has been some food that has come into the area, but these two communities that have come together, they're working together, they're used to surviving off of their land, off of their crops, and working with their animals. They've lost everything they own, but the one thing that's, that's good is that they're coming together and to help each other, as Haitians usually do. Oh, you mentioned everything was green, and you, that's something actually people can see visually. Take a look at this. This is put out by NASA. This is Earth Observatory. This is actually seen from space. Uh, this is an aerial view of, of Haiti, the before and after. You can see where it's a lot more green. That was definitely before uh, the hurricane here. A few more pictures of what that looks like. Little gifts just showing you the devastation along the coastline, just as you were mentioning. Uh, and this last one really puts it all in perspective. This is a before and an after over here on this screen. Stefan, one of the things that really made my ears perk up is Nina you know, said some people didn't even know it was coming. What are you hearing from people there? 
Of course, actually, uh, when the hurricane was coming, I was in New York. Uh, I was in New York, and I called my grandmother to let her know that we had a hurricane coming because she's based in the south, and she wasn't even aware that we were having a hurricane. And 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 it's the situation for a lot more people because you know the the, the communication is very difficult in the remote areas, and and so. The, start, the, the hurricane came by surprise to a lot of people, and they weren't prepared at all. You know, when you, when you say that, I, I just can't help but uh, look at this tweet that came in from Vladimir Laguerre. A lot of people pointing to maybe what is going wrong, why things aren't being fixed each time there's a problem like this. He says, Haiti doesn't need aid that can put the people in a consistent assistance ship, but aid that can help us to go back on the track. Uh, Danny, what do you make of that? And is that a problem? I mean, we often hear people criticize uh, some of the global aid efforts. Well, as we saw with the earthquake of 2010, a great deal of the resources that have been donated by private donators, donors, world donators, agencies, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, never really got to building the kind of infrastructure, communication structure, that would make it possible for Haitians to stand on their own and not be just waiting for assistance. It's clear that, that we have the possibility and the resources technologically and everything to make really Haiti a model with respect to earthquake renewal, flood renewal, all the things that a number of countries in the Caribbean have at their disposal. We not, that doesn't happen. That's one of the questions about why this doesn't happen, why the billions of dollars that could have gone into, into structural development, things that would have, would have anticipated the, uh, such a, 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 a hurricane such as this, were not put in place yeah. over the last six years. That's the major question that we ask as those uh, All right, so, the so major question there. Let's, let's push that over here to our side guests. Uh, uh, Gary, Jake, why is that not happening? Why did that not happen? Well, Malika, I think it's a failure of the Haitian government, and not just this one. I go back to the last 25, 30 years, where we know that hurricane is coming every year in Haiti, and yet there's been no disposition made. The reason that the international community can I do what Danny Glover is suggesting, which is a good idea, is that Haiti is a sovereign nation. They cannot implement, they cannot force things on the country that the leaders are not asking for, because there's all red tape and bureaucracy to actually get these things done. But when you have a totally irresponsible government successively running a country, then you have this catastrophe that we just had. When you look at the same uh, hurricane went through Cuba, Jamaica, and other Caribbean islands, it didn't do that kind of damage. And the question is really at the foot of the Haitian government. What are the short-term, the mid-term, the long-term strategy to make sure that every five years, I'm not back here talking about poor Haiti? And you know, it often right, feels right. like we're always talking well, about the same hey, thing. Hey, so go I ahead, like go Jake ahead. to say something about ahead, it. Donnie. Jake, why don't, you, why don't you comment on that? Yeah, I think I'd like Jake to say something about it. He's been around Haiti as, much, as long as I have. And, and certainly <laughs> it's easy to target the government when the government has been overthrown on four different occasions that we know, that we've had elections that were fraudulent elections, everything. So it's easy to talk about, in, in theory, Haiti's supposed sovereignty, when we know, quite frankly, that Haiti is not a sovereign country. We know that. So it's not, for us to bring up that, it's, it's, it's basically dishonest. So you gave the floor to Jake. Jake, I want to hear what you have to say, but I know we also, of course, have someone uh, 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 who is affiliated with the government, Stefan, but, but Jake, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it's important to hold the Haitian government accountable, obviously, but it's also important to hold international actors accountable for their role in weakening the Haitian government over decades, really, right? And purposely, even further back. Well, I mean, I think whether it's purposely or not, it's, a, it's the product of a system that's in place with how we interact with foreign countries, with how we deliver foreign aid. Uh, and a lot of those concerns about bypass passing the government does mean that even if the government did want to do some of those disaster preparedness things, money doesn't go towards preparation for the next. I mean, money gets mobilized after a disaster, right? That's when money's on the table, and it goes to immediate needs. Very little of it ever goes to building something more sustainable over the long term. I think when you're looking at a situation right now, I think it's important that everyone doesn't focus just on what's happening today, right, or the needs today, but is focusing on also how you can build that sustainability over the long term. 
of course. Stefan. I, I, I agree. I, I agree so much so with, with um, Jake. And I think this is the time for, for the aid approach to change in Haiti. I mean, uh, this is the second major disaster that we're having. And, and the approach to aid has to take a, a, a sustainable direction. Uh, of course, uh, uh, Hurricane Matthew has done a lot more damage than, than the actual earthquake we had because the demographics are different. Here we're dealing with people from the provinces, people who are relying on, on farming, people who are producing, um, who are sending ground produce to the capital, feeding the nation as a whole. Now, the, the approach is not to come and give aid every day, but it's to help these people rebuild their homes, go back to their plantations, because these are people who believe in hard work. And, and, and this is a major difference from, from, from the earthquake. And, and I think also that aid, aid and relief efforts have to be led by the Haitians because of course we need the cooperation of, of NGOs or foreign governments mm -hmm. but only Haitians know what is good for us and it's not up to any foreign governments or NGOs to impose a plan I think aid and relief efforts have to be led by the Haitian people so that we can move towards a sustainable culture instead of, uh, of giving out aid, aid kits and food kits every day to the people and I think it's 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 the time now to really change the approach of aid and, in Haiti because. And Stefan, I mean, I, you're talking about changing the approach of aid, and you know, we heard uh, you you blame not just the government. You can't just blame one party in this. And a lot of our communities, you know, bringing up those very same points. And the reason I. I want to jump in here is just to point to what Marriott's asking. I, I want to kind of get your thought on this. Marriott Williams saying, we are more than just, quote, the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere, often uh, how Haiti is referred to. We also have another tweet uh, from Vladimir saying, why the media, when talking about Haiti, they always refer to this one sentence, Haiti, the poorest country in the world. And the last tweet from Vladimir saying, why you never refer to Haiti as the first black republic in the world. Ninaj, I see you're nodding your head. Uh, any reaction to the, the way this is framed, not just by the media, but the international community as well? Yeah, I mean, I, think, I want to go back. Go ahead. Um, Jake was saying earlier that for decades, other countries have been interfering with, with Haiti's leadership. And we can even say centuries, because as um, folks said that are tweeting in, the, the Haiti is the first black republic. So if we want to really look at the root cause of the problems of today, we really have to go back to look at the beginning of the history of Haiti. When Haiti achieved freedom from France and became the first black republic, it took the U.S. Oh. over 60 years to recognize it, 63 years exactly. And this, in fact, was an embargo that they were imposing um, on mm -hmm. the U.S., not only for them not to do business, but asking other countries, uh, their friends, not to do business with Haiti. So when we talk about Haiti being the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere, we have to look at why Haiti is the poorest country. As, uh, as, as it was said in a program earlier, then they were forced to pay reparations to France later. And there's a whole history. I mean, we have to look at the, the time that the U.S. Marines occupied Haiti from 1915 to 1934. They came in there and controlled the government. Um, it's, it's, they control the um, customs, what comes in and out of the country. Um, they, they took away many of the trees. This is what was left after France, while they had colonized Haiti, had took away many trees and shipped them for lumber. The U.S. did the same during those 19 years. And so when we look at deforestation today in Haiti, which is often in the, in the um, media blamed on peasants, Mm. who only have machetes to cut branches to use for cooking wood. They don't have the equipment to cut the big trees that the um, lumber company that have been coming in Haiti over the decades so, so Nina, I, I hear what I you're think, saying. So, I so think, that think. said, that point you're making, uh, it's actually kind of echoed here um, by someone in our community. This is Westonley, who sent us a video comment. Um, and I want to push us just on a little bit because he links that history that is really important to know to then what can be done about it today. Have a listen to Westonley. As a historian, I am naturally inclined to believe that history has a lot to do with the contemporary situation in Haiti. Um, with regards to foreign involvement. There is this idea that Haitians are incapable of helping themselves, so in moments of crisis, um, there is a need to intervene. The problem with that is earlier intervention in terms of the American occupation of Haiti from 1915 to 1934 hasn't proved all that well for the country 100 years later. So, Gary, he seems to say there is a time, there are some points when aid is needed. Right now, where would aid be going? Where is it getting stopped? Is it getting to the people it needs to be getting to? Well, the first couple of weeks after a natural disaster, 
is usually chaotic. But, you know, we've been there before many times. And so I would like to again pose a question to the Haitian government. Where is the plan to address the natural disasters that we know are coming? I understand all the historical challenges that Haiti has faced since its independence, and they are real. But at some point, we got to stop being victim and take a of destiny course, to in our hands. And well, under, understand, understand, understanding, understanding, that, understanding, understanding that we are against powerful forces. But there are other countries that have done quite well for themselves, for, for the dignity of their people while dealing with the, 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 these superpowers. So if we are the first black republic and we are uh, freedom-minded people, we have to find a way to be free because aid does not develop anybody. So both Danny and Stefan had a rebuttal well, well, to that. Let's, let's, let's just give an example. You, you give an example of Cuba. Cuba is a sovereign country. Cuba has said all the be at the beginning, so when we had Hurricane Katrina, Cuba not only had the same intensity of that hurricane, not one life was lost. But in New Orleans, many people were displaced, their lives were lost, never to return as they are. So we have to be, this lay out the truth of what happens. Sovereign countries do have some voice in what happens there. Treat, uh, Cuba, which has offered help, the Cuban doctors are trained by, uh, Haitian doctors trained by Cubans, et cetera, et cetera. Clinics have been set up there. They're Cubans. The Cubans, for one, have laid us, have, have put, have made us, brought assistance to Haitians over the years. Venezuela has been another country. Country, uh, 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 the, the oil, the oil program, Petro Caribe, has been a help to Haiti. It's been, they've supplied Haiti with concrete and certain other things. We have to really call this where it is. Mm. Clinton apologized. Bill Clinton apologized for the role that he played in undermining ha Haiti's capacity to feed itself by importing rights. That has nothing to do with their sovereignty. I think, um, I think Gary is, I suppose, the serious question on the table, where, where do we go from here? And it, it's funny that almost two years later, and, and of course I'm a public servant, but I'm speaking as an engaged citizen in the country. Almost two years later, when I was here on the stream talking about five years after the earthquake, I remember my closing remarks had to do with encouraging the people to go out and vote for elections. And here we are almost two years later, still without elections. Mm. And we currently have a transitional government which doesn't have the proper capacity to deal with such a crisis and and we hoping to have elections as soon as possible on on the eye of the international community we need aid we need relief efforts and then internally here in haiti the focus is is as the focus on elections is as pressing as the focus on relief efforts because we need a legitimate government to take over reconstruction, to, to take over the handling of this, of this crisis that we're currently having. And that's also a very important issue for us in moving forward. And we need a new government that has the proper strategy, the, the strength and capacity building in order for us to not go through this all the time. Whenever we have a disaster, we're never prepared. And, and, and that's very important. And Stefan, because, 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 because you bring up that point of how important it is, not just uh, for the government and for you know, having leadership in Haiti, but in general, leadership uh, across all different avenues. We have a, a comment coming from Romel Jean-Pierre saying, absence of a real re leadership or too much monopoly and not profit of Matthew to create real urbanization plan. He is citing that as a mistake that's been made, uh, calling, calling for more leadership. And um, you know, on that same point, we have Mariette Williams kind of echoing the same point, saying the importance of partnering with small local organizations to avoid, for example, another Red Cross debacle. Of, um, and of course, this, this, I think this also goes back to my first point, which is letting the efforts be led by Haitians. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm originally from the South, and I've seen a great example of leadership from the mayor, and where, where you, have, you have a situation where those young people, the locals, you know, they're, they're coming together to clean the streets, they're coming together, going out with what they can partner with organizations that are distributing aid to help the people, knowing the reality of, of the country, the reality that we're going through. Of course, I think um, we, we, we're seeing a lot more cases of, 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 of local leadership. Of course, we've had a lack of leadership, but again, 
this crisis calls for Haitian-led initiatives mm. for us to get out of this limbo. And, 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 and Stefan, and Stefan you also, you're also talking about knowing the reality. Obviously, it's much easier to know the reality when you're on the ground. But um, with so many issues like this, protracted conflicts, and when you have kind of compounding issues, one disaster not really dealt with, and then another, um, perception tends to matter, as you guys know, as much as reality. And we have a comment about perceptions and how that impacts policy. Uh, video sent to us from Gina. Let's take a look at this. This is from Gina. What does it mean when conception of a place is only through its conditions? Uh, and I think that has eventually has historically impacted how policies enacted and so forth. So I'm always weary about that tendency then and the media to only see Haiti when there's sensationalism, right? When there's extremities, when there's, you know, it's poverty porn. That's in part, that's what it is. Um, so what I am somewhat optimistic about, actually, I am, is of late, you know, in the last couple of years especially, people are quick to call on and say, uh, 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 there's actually more to it. Well, I agree, it is poverty porn, and that's exactly what it is. But I think, how do you stop it? I think the Haitian people, the Haitian government, the private sector, all the uh, important actors need to come together and draft a, a, a vision for the country. Mm. What does Haiti want to be? A country of leaders, a leader in the Caribbean, or a country of mendicants that relies on foreign aid? And as long as we, as a country, don't make that first move. I mean, I agree with Danny. Last 20 something years has been a mockery of a democracy. There's been so much uh, a, a mingle, intermingling by other power, powers that be, that we haven't gotten to that point. We really never exercised the devil that we had dealt with prior to 1986. And so the problem I have with successive governments is that they haven't decided at one point, okay, you know what? This is not going well for us. What do we need to do? And this is beyond uh, the, the natural disasters and the U.S. media internationally, we focus on Haiti when yeah. these things happen. Right. But there are a lot of other issues happening in Haiti right Which is, now. Okay, so this brings me to a tweet we just got in. Someone's watching this conversation as we're having it. And this is Zach. He says, let's not politicize this while people are suffering. When two bulls fight, the grass trembles, our African proverb. Jake, I know that you were just there in Haiti. What is it that you heard from people? Were they talking about the lack of no elections? Or what were they talking about? Oh, I think it obviously depends. And I think this is coming back to a big problem that you had both in the earthquake and now is the centralization in Haiti, right? I mean, you've got the Republic of Port-au-Prince and then you have the rest of the country. When the earthquake hit, it hit the capital and that devastated the country because it devastated the capital where everything was concentrated. This time you had, you know, a hurricane that hit the rural areas and it devastated the rural areas because there is no presence of a central government there, right? But there are local governments. And I think, you know, the thing that I was struck by, and this goes to what Gina was saying about the perception is, you know, in the days after the earthquake, I mean, there are areas where there are no foreign aid groups, where there are no outside actors. It's Haitians who are helping themselves, right? It's Haitians who are doing what they need to do to get their life back on track. And the way it's portrayed is often as a victim, right? As these people waiting for assistance. Uh, and the quotes you usually read are from foreign aid workers who are talking about what Haitian people need. Uh, and there's very little effort to be to actually find out what communities want. And this goes, you know, to, to a lot of these things we've been talking about, which is not just the media sort of portraying Haitian voices, telling their own story, mm -hmm. but aid workers making sure they have contacts in local communities so they know what these communities actually need. I mean, I talked to uh, somebody who was down there, worked in the government, and was getting phone call after phone call after phone call from people saying, I've got a plane load of stuff and I want to bring it to Haiti to help. But they had no idea what, what these communities may have needed. And I always bring up the example of bottled water, right? I mean, there, <clears throat> there are companies in Haiti that produce bottled water, and yet one of the favorite things for foreign actors to do is send pallets of bottles of water from, from Florida, right? So, uh, so that's taking away uh, the livelihoods of those in Haiti who are doing just right. that job. Um, it's an interesting point. You also said something that I wrote down. There's little effort to find out what Haitians want. So that's exactly what we're doing in this show. That's all the time we have for now, uh, but this conversation will continue online, stream.aljazeera.com. I'll give the last word to this person on Twitter, Vladimir. I want you to know that Haitians are hard workers and fighters. Haiti can be great again. <laughs>